All right, looking at uh, the, the idea of influence guarding decisions. <clears throat> uh, the, uh, the, the text or the lesson opens with a, an account of, with an account of uh, the author, Tim Lewis, talking about uh, playing basketball at Oklahoma Christian after playing as a, in a junior college setting. Uh, one thing I thought was a little bit confusing, and I, and I thought probably need just as we go through the lesson, I, and I don't even know if this is all going to be brought out. I don't know if I'm going to bring all this out. It just as I was looking at it, there was something that struck me. And one is he opens up. Uh, he opens up by talking about how he was not a good influence when he was at Oklahoma Christian. All right, but we also have to remember that. Uh, he was a Christian while he was at Oklahoma Christian. In other words, remember, and I went all the way back to the beginning, to the very first lesson that talked about how his dad was, a, uh, was an unfaithful Christian and then was restored, and then he and his brothers, uh, uh, his mother was baptized, both of his brothers, uh, he were also baptized. And so the situation, uh, the situation as you see it, uh, if you can remember the entire story was that he was a Christian as a young man and that he was a Christian while he was at college, but he was not a faithful Christian. And then, uh, and then you'll see later on in the lesson, we, I, and I don't intend to deal with it, but it talks about Avon Malone, who was a great gospel preacher and writer and, and Bible uh, teacher. Uh, but uh, that the influence of Avon Malone encouraged him uh, to be more spiritually minded and that even when he finished his formal schooling, I believe he was an education major, that he stayed at Oklahoma Christian and pursued his Bible degree there. But the way, the way it unfolds is, I just want you to be, remember that he was a Christian during this time in which the, the, the setting opens. And that, uh, and that then he came back to faith later on in his in his college life and so he was talking about he and the story opens with his uh career at oklahoma christian and that as a as a walk-on as a junior college walk-on uh he played against you know the best players i guess he would be like on the scout team or whatever he played against the best players and he would be routinely bested or beaten by those players and when those things would happen he would mutter uh, unsavory words under his breath that he thought that nobody else could hear. And then later in his college days when he left that type of thinking and lifestyle and wanted to do what was right, that he approached that same individual a basketball player who was not a Christian and he said awkwardly tried to talk to him about salvation, about his soul and he said, he said, you know, you've been guarding me in basketball for two years and I hear what you say. You know, why, why, would I, why would I be interested in anything that you have to say because I've been listening to you curse for the last two years on the basketball court. And so that's kind of that's the whole impetus behind, uh, behind the lesson that, um, that uh, he, he destroyed his influence with this one individual and so uh and so that's where that's kind of where the the lesson begins and he says uh um in uh the last paragraph before the phrase or the section on the salt of the earth it's talking about oz guinness <clears throat> made the following charge against modern christians it says it's not that they aren't where they should be but that they aren't what they should be where they should be in other words, Christians, he's saying that Christians aren't Christians when they're outside of that Christian sphere. In other words, you know, they, 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 they practice their religion sincerely when they're in the confines of the church building, but when they're out in the world, they're not what they are in the world, what they are when they're inside the church building. And so that's the, and, and that's, you know, that's the charge that is, that is true uh, in, in really way too many cases. And so he's talking about uh, uh, Bible, uh, Bible examples of influence, uh, obviously beginning with salt. That's the easiest. Salt and light are the two, obviously the two easiest ones because they're found at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, after the Beatitudes, 
You know, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? In other words, when salt loses its flavor, it can't be re-seasoned. That's, that's the point. It can't be re-seasoned. So what's it good for? Well, it's not good for anything to be, but to be thrown out and, and trampled underfoot by men. Then follows it, then you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand so that it gives light to all that are in the house. Therefore, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So salt and light are obviously the two most well-known metaphors uh, for influence. And so we'll talk about, talk about uh, salt uh, here on the bottom of page uh, 91. I cannot help but think Freeman told this on, uh, he told this on Glenn Colley. And, uh, and uh, Glenn Colley was talking about salt. He said, salt is that stuff that makes your food taste bad when it's not on it. Salt is that stuff that makes your food taste bad when it's not on it. And, you know, and, and look, I am a salt-eating fiend. You know, I don't know, I don't know any, well, Rocky may eat more salt than I do, and he certainly eats more pepper than I do, but I eat a lot of salt. I mean, I'm going to, you know, you give me, you know, you give me an egg sandwich, and I'm going to salt it. I don't, and, you know, whatever, whatever I put on my plate, I'm going to salt. And my mom will tell you, I tell me, I, you, I salted that. It doesn't need salt. And I've said, look, if it's on my plate, it needs salt. I don't care how much salt you put on it, it needs salt, you know. I tell you something, so look, if you gave me a plate of salt to eat, I'd salt it before I ate it. I mean, that's how, that's how much I love salt, all right? So salt makes, you know, salt makes, you know, anybody put salt on an apple? Anybody put salt on a watermelon? Man, I mean, man, watermelon with salt is really good. And, uh, and so, you know, you think about, it, you know, you can eat salt on a lot of different things that, uh, uh, that, that you might not ordinarily think about. So, uh, salt enhances flavor. It uh, intensifies flavor. Uh, um, it makes things palatable or more palatable. Uh, but there are other influences that salt also has. I didn't realize this, but it says that salt also enhances the color of food. Now, I did not realize that. That salt... Go ahead, Jane. It softens water and it tenderizes meat. Softens water and tenderizes meat. I mean, there's a lot of, th there, there, there are a lot of good things, there are a lot of good things that salt does. Um, uh, salt is conspicuous by its presence, it's also conspicuous uh, by its absence. You know, I'll just give you an example. Um, I, I signed up for this HelloFresh, where they send you fresh food and, and you, it's easy to prepare, and it's healthy and whatnot. Well, apparently I threw away the, the, the recipe card. And so I made something last night while Rhonda was at Pound, and she came home. And uh, it was all right, but it wasn't as good as it was supposed to be. And you know one of the things that it didn't have on it that I was supposed to put on it? Salt. And there was a, something like oil, too. And by the way, oil has salt in it. You know, you're like you're cooking oil. It's got a lot of sodium and stuff in it. So, you know, I, I, I had left out two ingredients that were really important that would have made it a whole lot better uh, a whole lot better if I had, had put salt in it. And so salt is conspicuous by its presence. It's conspicuous uh, by its uh, absence. By the way, uh, this has been known since almost the beginning of time. In other words, salt has been used to flavor food from the very beginning of man's existence because Job is the oldest book of the Bible. Now, it doesn't record the oldest events of the Bible. Of course, that would be what Moses wrote about Genesis. But Moses wrote it 2,500 years after the fact. Job is the oldest book of the Bible. And Job said in Job 6 and verse 6, says, Can flavorless food be eaten without salt? So 4,000 years before, you know, 4,000 years or so before Christ, Job is talking about salt makes food taste better. So this is something that's been known. By the way, wars have been fought over salt <clears throat> because salt is not only uh, does not only enhance food, it preserves food. You know, you, uh, you know put up, you know, cut your ham. 
You know, when my grandpa got high blood pressure, they made him quit eating. They made him stop eating country ham. Why? Loaded with salt. And uh, one time a year, one time a year on New Year's Day, my grandpa would eat country ham and red eye gravy. As on, as only time, you know, that's the only time he would eat those one time a year. Why? Because because of the salt. But <clears throat> there's another thing that has to be remembered that you have to have some salt. Because I learned in biology when I was taking, uh, uh, in, uh, well, we were just studying basic human biology, that uh, salt affects the cell wall of, of your individual body cells and helps regulate what goes in and what goes out of, of, of your individual cells. And so if you don't have enough salt in your diet, it is extremely, it's extremely dangerous. Uh, and so... Uh, so, you know, salt, it, we might even say this, salt is a life-giving ingredient. And wars have been fought over salt uh, at times because it was so, uh, it was so valuable uh, that, uh, that people understood that they're willing to kill for it. And so, that's right. You know, guys I worked with at Co-op 25, 30 years ago, they still killed hogs. They took off last week in December, and they killed hogs every Every year. Has salt box. That's right. I'll tell you what else we had the first week of the new year. Crackle. <laughs> now that's some happening stuff. Especially when it's in cornbread. Man, I'd eat, it guys would bring that crackling in in that brown paper sack and you figure the bottom's fixing to fall out of it at any time. or so. It's almost dripping grease. We'd sit in there about an hour before work and eat crackling for an hour. And then you'd walk out and have to go to the warehouse and work with a stomach full of crackling. But man, it was just so good. So good. But it was salty. Man, I'm just... It, but salt, you know, salt is a, is a life... It is a life... It is a necessity of life. Uh, uh, also this. Uh, in Leviticus 2 and verse 13, God demanded that the offerings be made with salt. And, he, and, and then in Numbers 16 or Numbers 18, uh, you know, it says, This is the covenant of salt. In other words, there's going to be salt uh, in your offerings. Um, you know, this idea of, uh, of being salty, this influence, I think plays into uh, 1 Peter 3.15. You know, sanctify the Lord God in your heart and be ready to give an answer to every man who asks a reason of the hope that lies within you with meekness and fear. That's an, in other words, that is a, a life of influence that invites inquiry into, you know, in other words, you know what? You know what makes you? You know what makes you so different? Uh, a passage we often don't think about <clears throat> is a parallel uh, to Matthew five, and that's Mark nine and verse fifty, which talks about if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned again? But then he said this: Have salt in yourselves. That's a statement we hardly ever talk about when we talk about salt. But Jesus said, have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. And just what we were talking about with hog killing. You know, why do you have a salt box? You know, it preserves the meat. And Jesus says, if we have salt in ourselves, that having salt in ourselves contributes to the peace that exists among brethren. And so the salt that we have in ourselves preserves our unity, our harmony, uh, our, our peace. So Mark 9.50 is, is a very telling text in regard to the importance uh, of, of salt. And so, uh, so there's the first. Uh, also, uh, bottom of page 92, the light of the world. The light of the world. Light, I mean, again, you know, where there is no light, things die. Yeah, I had to move. I had to move some things today to, uh, <coughs> excuse me, to move my. Uh, I was going to hook up to my my trailer and go pick up something, and I had just, you know how you do sometimes. You just set things down for the time being and you leave them. And then, well, I had two or three old uh, garbage can lids laid out on the ground out in front of that trailer. Well, what what did I find whenever I picked them up to move them out of the way? Dead grass, and a lot of it white. 
You know, grass not supposed to be white. Clover not supposed to be white. Well, why was it white? Well, because you don't get what? That's right. You don't get photosynthesis without the sun. And the photosynthesis is what, you know, what makes it what it is. And so, so without the light, you know, without the light, those things, you know, those things die. Of course, we all know, you know, how important it is to get sunlight on your body, you know, because it's, you know, it's the vitamin D, the sun, you know, the sunlight uh, vitamin, which by the way, they believe that if you have high levels of vitamin D in your system, you are extremely resistant to COVID and its effects. Well, you know, I had a double dose because I spend quite a bit of time outside, at least running, try to run every day, spend time in the garden every day, and I take 5,000 units of vitamin D every day. You know, and I've been doing that for years, but it just turned out that it ended up being a secondary, you know, it ended up being a secondary benefit because I had COVID and the, you know, the symptoms were extremely mild and short lived. I was also I'm also O positive, and so there were two. There was a blood type that also seemed to be uh, particularly resistant to COVID. So I had the vitamin D and the O positive. So I had a lot of things working uh, working in my favor. But sunlight is extremely important, you know, to life. Uh, when we brought Shelby home from the hospital back in uh, 1991, she you know she got jaundice. You know what they told us to do? Strip her naked and put her in the sunlight. You know, so you know, we just happen to have a, a bay window in our, uh, at our, in our home, in the dining room. And, and the sun came in directly into that bay window. And we just, we, you know, stripped her naked and laid her in that little, that little basket. And we just let the sun get on her. And, you know, two or three days, she got better. You know, Eloise got jaundice when she was born. Of course, now they got, they got the lights they put them under. You know, they just, you know, they've got those special. But what is that light, rep, what's it replicating? Sunlight. It's just replicating, you know, it's just intensified sunlight. And so, you know, we understand in so many ways that, that sunlight and light uh, is important. Um, it's been uh, discovered that... Uh, in a lot of places where the water is not particularly potable, that if you'll put water in a clear container and leave it sitting all day long in the sun, the sun will kill almost all the bacteria in that water. So in places like Liberia and Kenya, uh, Ghana, where, where the water's not that great, they, they, they put giant, you know, clear containers of water and just let the sun, just let the sun hit them and it kills the bacteria and it makes it usable for, for you know, for cooking or bathing or, you know, or even drinking. So what we, you know, we're seeing the, you know, the power or the influence uh, of, of sun. Look at Furman's face. <laughs> you know, Furman has been exposed to the sun, maybe a little much. But, uh, but we understand, we understand that the power, the power of sunlight. And the Bible describes Christians as being the light of the world. Now, in this sense, we are the light of the world in the sense that we are lights in the midst of a world of darkness. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 15. Uh, you know, light always expels darkness. Always. That's why the Bible describes itself, its message, and its people as light. And the devil and everything that's associated him with darkness. So implied in that, implied in that is that if we are light, we always have the ability to overcome the wiles of the devil. You know, James said, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. And the thing is, he doesn't have a choice. Dark has no choice when light chases it out of a room. The devil has no choice. He has no power over a, a Bible, a, a faithful Bible practicing child of God. You know, the shield of faith quenches all the fiery darts of the devil, Ephesians chapter 6. And so we know that we are always victorious in dealing with the devil as long as we deal with him on the Lord's terms. 
You know, anytime I want to start dealing with the devil on my terms, you know, using my wisdom and, and what I think are, is my intelligence, I'm, I'm doomed. Because the devil's a lot smarter. He's a lot more sly. He's wily. Um, you know, I'm no match for the devil. But the Christian is always a match for the devil. I thought about this. The Bible says there's no darkness or there's no night in heaven. Because the Bible says that Jesus is the light. He's the light. So if Jesus is the light and he is in heaven, there will never be any darkness. No shadows. You know, there's, no, there's no shadows anywhere in heaven because, because the light of Christ is a perfect light. It, it completely engulfs uh, the heavenly realm. And so there's no place. There's no place for darkness in heaven because of the power and the influence uh, uh, of light. Um, I thought about, well, let me go over to page 93, uh, the middle of that top paragraph uh, that, show, that speaks about that Isaiah said that the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. Um, you know, I think the Jews missed this because I'm pretty sure that that's talking about Gentiles. Because when it, you know, when that, when that was, uh, well, look at Matthew 4 and verse 16, but it's also... It's also in the account of Jesus' birth uh, in Luke's account. But in Matthew uh, 4, it says, The land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. And so even Isaiah spoke about Jesus' effect or influence on the Gentiles. So many of the Jews missed it. You know, they, they, they thought it was always about them and about nobody else but them when their own scriptures said repeatedly the Gentiles are also going to be included, uh, included in this. And so, uh, but, uh, you know, Jesus is described as a, as a great a great life. Uh, in the uh, paragraph just above the paragraph on leaven, it says, he talks about, it says, As a convert to Christianity, I still remember the darkness of life without God and without Jesus, without the influence of the Bible and the loving encouragement uh, of the church. It said, Not only can I remember the darkness, I distinctly remember when the light of Christian influence came into my life and illuminated everything. And I, you know, I just, you know, there, there are some, there's some sense, there's some sense in which those of us uh, who were raised in the church in godly homes don't understand this to the extent that others do. In other words, you know, uh, well, I'll just use, I'll just use, I can use Lynn or, or, or Philip as an example, you know, those guys were not, you know, they weren't raised in, in the Lord's church. But at, at some point, a light came on. Now, it may not have come on all at one time. It may have just been, you know, a little bit, you know, Lord, you're coming out of darkness a little bit by a little bit by a little bit. But sometimes the light comes on in a hurry. And, and, and you know, a lot of us don't have in our own lives that, for lack of a better term, we don't have that aha moment. You know that, you know, I'm however I'm however many years old, and I'm lost. I'm lost. And 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 so you know, there's something about there's something about people who have who have that uh, that aha you know that aha moment. Um, you know, a lot of you were not raised in the church, and and a lot of you understand. You know, you you probably know when you finally understood. I'm lost, and I've got to do. I've got to do something about it, and uh, and that's that's a transformative moment. Uh, at least it should be. And you know, a lot of us don't really have that, and that's why so many of us that were raised in the church we get lackadaisical, we get lazy, we get complacent because it's always you know it's always been there's always been something about you. Know, we've always been a part of it, and and so we don't appreciate it the way. Uh, that others that others do, and so so you know Tim talked about his appreciation uh, for seeing that light for the first time, and, and you know dawning on him uh, that he 
uh, was lost. Then bottom of page 93 over to 94 is the matter of leaven. This would be obviously our third most obvious uh, influence statement because our, our illustration because Jesus told the parable, you know, the kingdom, of, the kingdom of God is like a little leaven that a woman put in some, in a, you know, lump of bread, you know, and it leavened, you know, it leavened the whole lump. You think about, you know, how little leaven it takes to, to fill a whole, a whole lump of bread. It, it's really amazing if you think about it. I mean, it's really amazing if you think about it. And, and Jesus said the kingdom of God's like that. That, uh, in other words, the kingdom of God doesn't have to start with, with a grand beginning. You know, it, just has, it just has to be true to what it is. And I love, I love the statement at the bottom of that top paragraph, uh, the, next to the last line that begins with leaven. I love this line. Leaven does what it does because of what it is. In other words, leaven doesn't have to be commanded to be leaven. Leaven doesn't have to be energized to be. In other words, it's leaven, and leaven's going to leaven. And he says, if our lives, you know, if we are like leaven, then our lives should, we should naturally do what Christians do. In other words, those things, even though at first they don't come naturally to us, the longer that we practice our faith and are faithfully growing and, and practicing our faith, the more natural it comes to be leavened. Does that make sense? And so, uh, and ultimately what he's saying is that there ought to come a time in the life of the child of God where doing right is the natural thing as opposed to, do, to doing wrong. It's not that you always do right every single time, but doing right becomes the natural response. Uh, you know, uh, using the example of Christ, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. In other words, it was natural for Christ to do what was right. Doesn't mean it was always easy for Christ to do what was right, but it was natural for him to do what was right. And so as, as, as the, the influence of God's Word and, and, you know, and the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives through the Word of God, the, the, the more that it leavens, uh, the more that, that it leavens us, then the easier it is for us to be leavened. In other words, the, the more natural it is uh, for us to be uh, leavened. All right, then over on page 95, the epistle of Christ. Uh, 2 Corinthians 3, verses 2 and 3 are the passage, is the passage there. It starts at the end of the third line. You are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Clearly, you are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tables of stone, but on tables of flesh, that is, of the heart. And so Paul talks about Christians as being living letters. In other words, when the Word of God is written in our hearts, it becomes a living, we become living letters that can be known and read by all men. Known and read by all men. And so we want to, you know, we want to strive to be living letters. Look at the, the second paragraph into the first line. When my life is an open letter, what does it say to others about Jesus? You know, if my life is an open letter, in other words, by the way, our lives are a letter. You know, it'll either be a letter of Christ or it'll be not a letter of Christ. But, but we can be known and read by all men, whether we're good or whether we are evil. Paul is commending the church at Corinth for being an epistle of Christ. In other words, people can see, and by the way, think about living in Corinth, you know, the kind of world they lived in. I mean, they were obviously different than the rest of the people living in Corinth. And it says, it's e you're, 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 the word has been written in your heart. Kind of like what David said, thy word I have hidden in my heart 
that I might not sin against thee. And so he says, you are, you are a, a living uh, representation of the word of God. A second, uh, end of second line. As people read the pages of my life, what do they learn about me? And more important, what impact does that have on how they see Jesus and the church? Um, you know, the bottom of page, bottom of page 95. Actions speak louder than words. When we take on the name of Jesus and claim to be Christians, like what you read about in the Bible, people have every right to expect us to live by a higher standard. You know, we, a lot of times we don't like to be held to higher standards because we think that's not fair. But he's right. If we're going to wear the name of Jesus and we're going to claim to be the church that Jesus came and established, people have the right to demand that we live better than they do. They have the right to demand that. Because if we're going to make the claim, then we have to be willing to be held to the standard that is associated with the claim. They deserve to see commitment and consistency as we live out our faith. If we are truly known and read by all men, what others know about us and what they hear us say and see us do is of utmost importance. Uh, Guy in Woods used to uh, finish his, he had a classic sermon on the book of Philippians. It was an overview of the book of Philippians. And, and he preached it a, a number of times over the course of 50 years of preaching. Um, and uh, he, would close that, he would close that sermon uh, with this little poem. He'd say, we are writing a chapter, or we are writing a gospel, a chapter each day, by the deeds that we do and the words that we say. Men, read what we write, whether faithless or true. So say, what is the gospel according to you? That's pretty powerful. It's pretty powerful. And that's what, that's what we're talking about here to be an epistle known and read uh, by all men. Then lastly, uh, page 96 and 97, to be ambassadors for Christ. Uh, and he, and, and Tim, by the way, Tim, I don't know if y'all read this far into the lesson, but Tim is right. There are some of our brethren who believe that Paul's statement about being an ambassador for Christ is confined to the people and the era of the apostles. And look, even if they're right about this particular statement, doesn't it make sense that we should also be, you know, even if this text is not talking about us, doesn't it make sense that we also ought to be ambassadors for Christ? I mean, what is an ambassador? An ambassador is a person who represents the interest of one greater than him to other people. You know, you know, for example, the American ambassador to Ghana represents the American the, represents America's interest in the nation of Ghana, and then also works to serve Americans that are in the nation of Ghana. That's you know that's pr the primary thing, and also helps to facilitate goodwill and and and, and unity between those two nations. Well, if we're going to use that as, if we're going to use that as the measuring stick, don't Christians do that to the world? Don't we represent a greater kingdom to, a, you know, to the kingdom of the world? And aren't, aren't, we, supposed to, aren't we supposed to facilitate goodwill and, and bring reconciliation between the kingdom that we represent and the, and the people, and the people that, you know, that we meet in the world? You know, one of the greatest, I think one of the greatest testimonies I, I ever heard about the Church of Christ was given to me by a Muslim. Uh, in Takarati, Ghana, uh, on the very on my very first trip to Ghana, I met a, a Muslim businessman. He, and when I say a businessman, he had a little shop that you could fit between these two chairs, and it was on the sidewalk. He didn't even have, you know, he didn't even have anything inside a store. He was on the sidewalk, and that was his business. His name was Kwame Kwadir, and he was a Muslim. And uh, I bought some things from him that we needed because we got over there and needed some items. And so then every year after that, I always went 
and I hunted him up, and he was always glad to see me, and we, you know, we inquired about each other's health and families and whatnot. And Kwame Quadir told me, this is probably about the fourth or fifth year I was there, he told me, unsolicited, he said, the Church of Christ are the best people in this city. That's what he said. And he's a Muslim. He said, the Church of Christ are the best people in this city. He said, people need something, you know, people are, are in need, you know, they, they get sick or whatever. He said, they help people. They help people. And I thought, man, that's, you know, you know, in other words, somebody has been an ambassador. Somebody has been an ambassador. Uh, to my knowledge, he never did obey the gospel. He did imply that someday that he hoped to be a member of the Church of Christ. Now, I don't know if he's just saying that because I was there doing business with him. But, but, but he told me unsolicited. He said, members of the Church of Christ are the best people in this city. And that's a city of three, three quarters of a million people. And so I thought, man, that's a great, you know, that's a great testimony uh, to you know, the ambassadorship of, of, of local brethren. So, um, you know, and the last paragraph is, when it comes to influence, it is impossible to be neutral. And you know, we're either a good influence or we're a bad influence. He says it's nearly impossible to be neutral. I'm telling you, it's absolutely impossible to be neutral because Jesus didn't say, he who is not with me and is also not against me is it somewhere in the middle. He said, he who is not with me is against me. And so our influence is of, of vital importance. And so the last line says, we need to guard our influence by consistently choosing right over wrong and, God's, and being, doing God's best over merely being good enough. All right, Lord willing, next week, chapter 11. Talking about our, our thoughts, our minds, whatever you think.